what we can do now is open it up for questions. We have a question um, here. Thank you for the compliment. My question is about liposclerosing mixed up fibrous tumors and overlap with annihilation. So um, LSMFT, liposclerosing mixed up fibrous tumor, we didn't show in this case, but it basically loves the um, proximal femur and the femoral neck. And typically you'll see a lesion that may or may not have fat, it might have microscopic fat, um, might have some cysts in it, it might be sclerotic, and um, that can look like other lesions. And it, it is thought to be, I think, a borderline, it can be benign, but it might be malignant. I think it's controversial. Um, it's not certainly a malignant lesion. But um, if you just had fibrous dysplasia or lipoma with cystic degeneration, um, that could also have a similar appearance there as well. And let's see here. What other questions do you guys have? Hopefully you guys uh, feel like now, um, if, if you didn't, that you also that you have kind of a better way to kind of just face an unknown lesion. So remember that you want to um, look if it's loosened or sclerotic, is it well-defined or ill-defined, and then just kind of put in your differential diagnosis some of those um, lesions that we talked about. We have a question here, uh, how to differentiate between chondroma and periosteal osteosarcoma. Um, so you have these entities known as surface osteosarcomas. Um, which are par osteo PAR, which is usually a very, very dense sclerotic lesion, and peri osteosarcoma. Um, and so that is, um, it is hard. Um, those are, they have a, a different appearance. Uh, osteosarcoma will typically have more of an aggressive appearance, uh, more of a more malignant, more of a soft tissue mass. Chondromas, um, you'll have that lobular, microlobulated um, appearance. And when you give contrast, it might have. Uh, kind of a rim enhancement, sort of punctate areas of enhancement different than you might see with more of a solid enhancing tumor in an osteosarcoma. Are there specific radiographic features of B-core sarcomas? Wow, you guys are super advanced. Um, there probably are. Um, I'm not totally sure uh, if, if, if there are specific that I know of, but I, I have heard of that. And I know that's like a pathologic uh, distinction. On some of the large lesions like ABC, how are diagnosis being made? Are they resected for diagnosis? What happens to the remaining mode? Is it buttress or heart? Okay. So ABCs, um, aneurysmal bone cysts, they are going to get worse and worse and get bigger over time. And you need to treat them. The typical treatment um, was surgical curatage and bone graft. Now there's some newer exciting treatments. Um, our IR guys here. Are doing really really exciting things. My uh, partner uh, Shankar Rajaswaran is doing really exciting things with um, these cysts. He is going in there and he is doing uh, basically um, sclerosis, grafting, and even cryoablation of these lesions for minimally invasive techniques. And so there's some newer things coming out. What about myeloproliferative disease and bone marrow changes? What to look up? So. Um, for example, if you are talking about uh, malignant, uh, diffuse malignant processes, such as uh, leukemia, uh, for example, is one that I, I think is important to know what that looks like. You're gonna see a diffuse marrow replacement. So uh, the whole marrow will be very, very T2 hyper intense and dark on T1 uh, uh, for those cases. Does that answer the question there? In the intraarticular osteostomic case, can we differentiate Osmosis with sequestration, very good question. So sequestration, which is a small bit of sclerotic bone, dead bone, which can serve as a nidus for infection. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. That could look similarly to an osteodosteoma. You probably would have a history of osteomyelitis that was refractory to treatment, and then you will follow up MR and you find that, but you're right, that could look similar. Usually it's more of just a dense sclerotic white piece, not like a beautiful round, um, uh, area of, of a nidus, but you're right, that could look similar. And uh, in this case, um, they did a cryoablation, they biopsied it, and they also then cryoed it, and there were no other, um, some patient were approved right away. Can you explain case number 15 again? Yes, let's go back to that. So for case 15, this is a hard case. We see two lesions, 
one lesion is here. And if I just saw this, I would say that there is an ill-defined lucent lesion. And I'd be concerned, hearing myself say ill-defined lucent lesion in the pelvis, I'd be concerned this was a malignant lesion, such as Ewing sarcoma, which can occur in the pelvis. Yet when I look at this other lesion, this is a lucent lesion, which has a well-defined margin, and it has a sclerotic rim. That actually looks more benign. So um, you do have to give a differential diagnosis for this case. So this could be Ewing sarcoma with a metastasis to the pelvis. However, I think it's important for us to give a differential diagnosis. It was a, a young child, family was very worried, and they just asked, is there anything that this could else be? Could this be something benign? And that's when I said, well, it actually could be LCH. And so that's what it was. So it's good to have a differential diagnosis. Um, then there's a question here. Sorry, there's a question of uh, prognosis of osteofibrous dysplasia. So um, osteofibrous dysplasia, basically it's, uh, it's fibrous dysplasia. And if it's truly not a um, adamantinoma, it's a benign lesion and it may just kind of get better. They may have to, if it has a pathologic fracture, they may have to treat that. Uh, they may have to stabilize the bone, but it is a benign lesion. And then what about the right SI joint, especially the ilium? I assume talking about the other case. Um, yes, it does look a little sclerotic here. Um, is that, that may be what you were worried about. Um, in this case, uh, I, I think it might just be some overlapping stool. Uh, I don't remember the case exactly, but um, don't worry about that there. Stress fractures in plain x-ray. Um, so stress fractures. If you have uh, just a early stress fracture, you may not see anything on x-ray. Uh, as we know, the MRI will show the edema, whereas x-ray could look normal. However, uh, as we have a healing stress fracture, you're going to see the um, periosteal new bone, and you're going to sometimes see a little loosened fracture cleft buried in the cortex. So if you see periosteal reaction and thickening, that's what a stress fracture would look like. When, uh, let's see here, best book for bone tumors? <laughs> um, good question. Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, and I don't wanna, I, 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 don't, I don't know. There's many good, there's many good things, uh, many good things out there. Uh, let's see here. When should we consider METs in pediatric x-rays and which all primary should we love for? So if you see METs, so the thing in pediatrics is that it's not as common as in adults. In adults, when you see bone lesions, you always throw in METs for, uh, the diagnosis. In pediatrics, um, neuroblastoma, um, which is very, very young children, will go to bones. That's what we want to think about. Neuroblastoma is a big one. Um, so that would be a primary to rule out is neuroblastoma. Please explain avulsive cortical irregularity. So avulsive cortical irregularities, think of it as just the origin of the gastroc tendon is basically pulling on the back of the femoral cortex. So it just causes kind of a little bit of irregularity and a little bit of like bone breakdown. So it can produce this lucent lesion. That's why it's just called avulsive cortical irregularity. Just the name is saying what it's doing. Um, site of unicameral bones is, can it be in the epiphysis? What is the difference between case five and case 14? It can be in the epiphysis. Um, that is possible. It's not as common. Um, so in case 14, you're right. You could include this in the differential diagnosis. When you do MRI though, a cyst will have central non-enhancement, just rim enhancement, whereas a chondroblastoma would actually be solid enhancement. Um, case five is basically a lucent lesion with a sclerotic rim. And this is basically um, a more common location for unicameral bone cyst in the metadiaphysis. Uh, is there a lesion in case two, proximal fibula? Yes, there is a lesion in case two. Very good. This is another non-ossifying fibroma. Very, very good. You guys are excellent. You guys are awesome. You don't need my help, but hopefully you guys feel more comfortable about approaching bone lesions, which bone lesions you need to know. Are you related to possibly a descendant of my high school classmate, Carol Samitz, a cellist, I think, class of 1967, St. Louis, Missouri. Sorry, I am not. I am from Baltimore, Maryland. Um, not that I know of. Net NOF versus uh, FCD. Um, is that focal cartilaginous dysplasia, I assume? Um, focal cartilaginous dysplasia is a rare entity that um, 
we typically see in the proximal tibia or distal radius, and it looks like a, a weird like notch or concavity in the bone, whereas NOF is a lesion that is kind of filling the bone, if that is the question you're asking. How to differentiate chondromyxin fibroma and end chondromal lesion in the distal tibial metadiaphysis? Forgot the case number. So um, chondromyxin fibroma is a lesion that can also look locally aggressive. It can be a lucent lesion. It is not as common as enchondroma. Enchondroma is much more common. Um, enchondromas love the fingers, so um, that will be more common. You may not be able to differentiate those as well. Um, I actually had a case once that I presented at a meeting of chondromyxin fibroma of the toe. And you're right, it could look similar, but common things being common, chondroma more common. Appearance of chondroma on MRI, please. So we showed a case of uh, a chondroma, and basically it is a lobular T2 hyperintense lesion, which is um, typical for a chondroid lesion. And what you can see here is that it has these like kind of microlobulated margins um, that is very characteristic. And if it is sitting on a cortex, then you think of periosteochondroma. What is the indication for MRI? Can we diagnose most of them by plain x-ray? Good question. We love to have x-ray first. Um, x-ray can diagnose many of these lesions. I think MRI, um, it, traditionally people used to say MRI is only for staging of disease, not for diagnosis of lesion. I don't totally agree with that. I actually think MRI is really helpful to distinguish solid versus cystic. As you saw in a lot of the cases and prior questions, some of these lucent lesions, you're not sure if it's cystic or solid. So is it a chondroblastoma or is it a unicameral bone cyst? But when you do an MRI with contrast, you can see that a cyst will have rim enhancement and a chondroblastoma will have solid enhancement. So um, that's when I would do MRI. And also, if you have a lesion on x-ray and you don't, it doesn't fit into a benign category and you don't know what it is, that is an indication for an MRI. I think as a radiologist, if you see a lesion, it's not something that you can neatly put into a benign category. I think you should do an MRI and I don't think you should let it go. Eighty-two questions answered. I'm firing off the answers. Keep them coming. You got any more questions? Hey, so up oh, there it is. <laughs> One more question. <laughs> Typical location for chondroma. Uh, I assume you're referring to periosteal juxtacortical chondroma. Um, I've seen them in the humerus. Um, I've seen them in the proximal tibia and in the tibial tubercle. But uh, I'd have to look up uh, to see uh, uh, distribution uh, if I was going to give you an exact answer. All right. I think you answered everybody's questions. Oh, one more just came in. Dr. Sam. Bone <laughs> rads in children. Um, I'm not sure what the question is. Is that referring to, is there like an ORADS, like a system to kind of um, help define, uh, help you put things good to grade lesions. Not that I know of. I know that ORADS is kind of coming up for adult lesions, but um, not, not that I know of for pediatrics specifically. How to tell part between chondroblastoma and giant septum of bone. Good question. So remember that kind of think of 20 years old as a cutoff. Uh, we don't really see giant cell tumor of bone below 20. So if the, if the growth plates are open, you pretty much never see giant cell tumor of bone. And so you can use kind of that to help you. Chondroblastoma bone usually is in the epiphysis. Giant cell tumor bone is in the epiphysis, but it actually is in the metaphysis and the epiphysis. And so um, when we very, very rarely see them in pediatrics, it actually is in the metaphysis. And that's why people think they originate from there. So I would think 20 years old is kind of a good number to remember to differentiate those. Uh, 